This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. Lecture 9 is entitled The Influence of the Sun and Moon Spirits, of the Isis and Osiris Forces, A Change in Consciousness, A Conquest of the Physical Plane, given on September 11, 1908. In the preceding lectures, we reviewed in some detail a number of facts concerning the evolution of humanity. I tried to show how man developed in the period of evolution that stretches approximately from the moment when the sun withdrew from the earth to the time when the moon also departed. Today something will be added to these facts, which could be called facts of occult anatomy and physiology. In order to understand everything properly, however, Today we must throw a little light on certain other facts of the spiritual life, for we must not forget that what is really to be demonstrated is the relation between the Egyptian myths and mysteries, between the whole Egyptian cultural period and our own time. Therefore it is necessary that we be entirely clear about how evolution progressed further through the various epochs. Let us again recall what was described as the working of the sun and moon spirits, especially of the Osiris and Isis forces, through whose activities the human body first appeared and was built up. Remember that this occurred in the remote past, that our earth as yet had scarcely crystallized out of the water earth, and that a great part of what was described actually took place in the water earth. Man at that time was in a condition that we should bring clearly before our minds, so that we may form a clear conception of how things looked to human vision during man's progress through evolution. I have described how man's lower members, the feet, shanks, knees, etc., appeared as physical forms as early as the time when the sun had shown indications of withdrawing from the earth. But we must always remember what has been said so often. All this would have been visible had there been a human eye to see it. But such an eye did not exist. It appeared only much later. While man was still in the water earth, he perceived only by means of the organ described as the pineal gland. Perception by means of the physical eye began only after the hip region had been formed. Thus we may say that man already had the lower part of the human form, but possessed nothing whereby he could have seen the body. At that time man could not see himself. Only at the moment when his body, building itself up from below, passed the region of the hips, did man receive the capacity of seeing himself. When he was shaped as far as the sign of the balance, man's eyes were opened for the first time. Then he began to see himself as in a mist. Then he developed the vision of objects. Until the hip region evolved, all human perception, all seeing, was of a clairvoyant, astral, etheric nature. At that time man could not yet see physical things. Human consciousness was still dark and shadowy, though of a dreamy, clairvoyant nature. Then man passed over to that condition of consciousness in which sleeping and waking alternated. When he was awake, man saw darkly what was physical, as though it were wrapped in mist and surrounded by an aura of light. In his sleep, Man rose to the spiritual worlds and the divine spiritual beings. He alternated between a clairvoyant consciousness which grew ever weaker and a day consciousness, an object consciousness, which grew stronger and stronger and is the head consciousness of today. Gradually he lost the capacity of clairvoyant perception, together with the faculty of seeing the gods in sleep. However, the clarity of day consciousness waxed in the same proportion, and the consciousness of self, the eye-feeling, the eye-perception, grew stronger. If we look back into the Lemurian time, into the time before, during, and after the moon's exit from the earth, we find that man then had a clairvoyant consciousness in which he had no inkling of what we today call death. If... For if at that time man withdrew from his physical body, whether through sleep or through death, his consciousness did not diminish. On the contrary, he received a higher consciousness, and in certain ways one more spiritual than his consciousness when in his physical body. 
He never said to himself, Now I am dying, or I am falling into unconsciousness. That did not exist in those times. Man did not yet rely on his own feeling of self, but he felt himself immortal in the womb of divinity. And for him all that we describe here today were obvious facts. Let us imagine that we lie down to sleep, that the astral body removes itself from the physical, and that all this happens in the full moon. We have the physical and etheric bodies lying in bed, the astral body hovering above, and all of this in the full moonlight. Now the situation is not so that an astral cloud simply becomes visible there for the clairvoyant. On the contrary, what he actually sees is streams from the astral body into the physical, and these streams are the forces that remove fatigue in the night. They bring to the physical body replenishment for the wear and tear of the day, so that it feels refreshed and quickened. At the same time, one would see spiritual streams proceeding from the moon, and these streams were permeated by astral powers. One would see how there actually proceed from the moon spiritual effects that permeate and strengthen the astral body and influence its working on the physical body. Let us assume that we are men of the old Lemurian time. Then the astral body would have perceived this streaming in of the spiritual forces, would have gazed upward and said, This is Osiris who strengthens me, who works on me. I see how his influence goes through me. We would have felt ourselves sheltered in Osiris during the night. We would have lived, so to say, in Osiris with our ego. We would have felt, I and Osiris are one. Had we been able to give words to what we felt at that time, we would have described it approximately thus when we returned into the physical body. Now I must descend again into the physical body that waits for me there below, this is a time when I must dive down into my lower nature. We should have rejoiced when the time came, when we could leave the physical body once again and rise up to rest in the lap of Osiris or in the lap of Isis, where we again united our ego with Osiris. As the physical body evolved further, and especially after the development of the upper members, man could see more physically, could perceive the objects in the physical world about him, in the same proportion, however, he had to tarry longer when he descended into his physical body. He took more interest in the physical world. His consciousness grew darker for, for the spiritual world as his consciousness in the physical body became clearer. <clears throat> he, he became disaccustomed to the spiritual world. Thus the life of man in the physical world evolved further, and in the conditions that prevailed between death and a new birth, consciousness grew darker and darker. In the Atlantean time man lost almost entirely the feeling of being at home with the gods, and when the great catastrophe was past, a great part of mankind had completely lost the natural ability to gaze into the spiritual world at night. But in place of this they gained the capacity of seeing ever more sharply by day, so that the objects around them appeared in ever clearer outlines. We have already pointed out that among the men who had remained behind, the gift of clairvoyance was still preserved, even in the post-Atlantean cultures. At the time when Christianity was founded, remnants of this clairvoyance still existed, and even today there are occasional persons who have preserved it as a natural gift. But this clairvoyance is entirely different from that which is gained through esoteric training. Thus night gradually grew dark for man in Atlantis while day consciousness began to light up. The night was without consciousness for the people of the first post-Atlantean culture, whom we tried to characterize in all their greatness, in the spirituality that entered through the holy rishis. In the earlier lectures we examined these people, and now we must describe them from another side. Let us try to enter into the souls of the pupils of the holy rishis, into the souls of the people of the Indian culture in general, in the time immediately after the last traces of the great Atlantean water catastrophes had vanished. A sort of memory of the ancient world still lived in the soul, a memory of that world in which man experienced and saw the gods who worked on his body, a memory of how Osiris and Isis worked on him. 
Now he had emerged from this world, out of the womb of the gods. Formerly all this had been present to him as the physical is present to him today. Like a memory this passed through the mind of the Indian man of the first post-Atlantean times, to whom the Rishi still could speak of how things actually had been. He knew that the Rishis and their pupils still could see into the spiritual world, but he also knew that for the normal person of the Indian culture the time was past when he could see into the spiritual world. Like a painful memory of his old true home, this went through the soul of the ancient Indian when he saw himself transplanted into the physical world, which is only the outer shell of the spiritual world. He yearned to be out of this external world. He felt unreal are the mountains and valleys, unreal the cloud masses in the air, unreal even the firmament. All this is only like a sheath, like the physiognomy of a real being, and we cannot see the reality behind this the gods, and the true form of man. What we see as maya is unreal, the real is veiled. The feeling grew ever keener that man had sprung from the truth and had his real home in the spiritual, that the things of sense were untrue, were maya, and that the physical world of the senses was like night around him. Footnote for a clear expression of this sentiment, see title Sacred Books in Early Literature of the East, New York, Park, Austin, and Lipscomb, 1917, Volume 9, page 104, end of footnote. When one feels so strongly the contrast between the spiritual and the unreal physical, the religious mood will tend to produce little interest in the physical world and to lead the spirit toward what the initiates see, as to which the holy rishis could give knowledge. The ancient Indian longed to escape from this hard reality, which for him was nothing but illusion, for to him the true was not what his senses perceived, but what lay beyond that. Therefore the first post-Atlantean culture entertained little interest for what occurred externally on the physical plane. Things were already different among the Persians in the second cultural period out of which arose Zarathustra, the great pupil of Manu. If we wish to characterize in a few strokes the difference between the Indian and Persian cultures, we may say that a member of the Persian culture felt the physical to be not merely a burden, but a task to be fulfilled. He also looked up into the regions of light, into the spiritual worlds, but he turned his gaze back into the physical world, and in his soul he saw how everything divides into the powers of light and the powers of darkness. The physical world became for him a field of work. The Persian said to himself, There is the bene beneficent fullness of the light, the god Ahura Mazda, or Ormuzd, and there are the dark powers under the le leadership of Angra Mainyush, or Araman. From Ahura Mazda comes salvation for men, from Araman comes the physical world. We must transform what comes from Araman, we must unite with the good gods and vanquish Araman, the evil god in matter, by transforming the earth by becoming beings capable of working upon the earth. By thus vanquishing Araman, we make the earth into a medium for the good. The first step toward redeeming the earth was taken by the members of the Persian culture. They hoped that the earth would become a good planet one day, that it would be redeemed, and that a glorification of Ahura Mazda, the highest being, would come about. <clears throat> thus a man felt who did not gaze up into the sublime heights like the Indian, but planted his feet firmly on this physical earth. A member of the Indian culture, who did not plant his feet in this way, would not have thought thus. The conquest of the physical plane proceeded further in the third cultural epoch, in the Egyptian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Chaldean culture. At this time hardly anything remained of the ancient repugnance with which the physical world was felt to be Maya, the Chaldeans looked up to the heavens, and the light of the stars it was not merely Maya for them. It was the script that the gods had imprinted on the physical plane. On the paths of the stars the Chaldean priest pursued his way back into the spiritual world, and when he was initiated, when he learned to know all the beings who inhabited the planets and the stars, he lifted up his eyes and said, What I see with my eyes when I gaze up to the heavens is the outer expression of what is given me by occult vision, by initiation. 
when the initiating priest endows me with the grace of the perception of the divine, then I see God. But all I see externally is not mere illusions. I see in it the handwriting of the gods. The initiate felt as we would feel if we had been long separated from a friend, then received a letter from him and recognized his familiar handwriting. We see that it was our friend's hand that formed these signs, and we observe the feelings of his heart expressed in them. Approximately thus felt the Chaldean initiate and also the Egyptian, who was inducted into the holy mysteries, and who, while he was in the mystery temple, saw with his spiritual eye, E-Y-E, the spiritual beings that are connected with our earth. When he went out again, after seeing all this, and cast his eyes on the world of stars, this appeared to him like a letter from the spiritual beings. He perceived a script of the gods. In the blaze of the lightning, in the rolling of the thunder, in the tempest, he saw a revelation of the gods. The gods manifested themselves for him in all that he saw externally. As we feel about the letter from a friend, so did he feel in regard to the outer world. Thus did he feel when he saw the world of the elements, the world of plants, animals, and mountains, the world of the clouds, the world of the stars. Everything was deciphered as a divine script. The Egyptian had confidence in the laws that man could find in the physical world, through which man can master matter. By this means arose geometry, mathematics. With the help of this, Man could rule the elements because he trusted in what his spirit could find, because he believed that he could imprint the spirit upon matter. Thus he could build the pyramids, the temples, and the sphinxes. This was a mighty step in the conquest of the physical plane that was accomplished in the third cultural period. Man had progressed so far that for the first time he was able rightly to respect the physical plane. The physical world began to mean something to him, but what kind of teachers did he require for this? Man had always needed teachers. Even the initiates had teachers, as in the old Indian time. What kind of teachers did the initiates need? It was necessary that the initiate should be artificially led to see again during initiation what man had been able to see previously in his dark clairvoyant consciousness. The neophyte had to be led back into the spiritual world, into the earlier home of the spirit, so that he could communicate to others what he learned from his experiences. For this he needed teachers. The pupils of the Rishis needed teachers who could show them what happened in ancient Lemuria and Atlantis when man was still clairvoyant. The same was also true for the Persians. Of the Persians. It was different with the Chaldeans, and even more different with the Egyptians. They also had teachers who aided the pupil to develop his powers so that he could see, through clairvoyant vision, into the spiritual world behind the physical world. These were the initiators who showed what lay behind the physical. But a new teaching, a wholly new method, became necessary in Egypt. In ancient India, man had troubled himself little about how what happened in the spiritual world was imprinted upon the physical plane, about the correspondence between gods and men. But in Egypt something else was needed. It was necessary that through initiation the pupil should see the gods, but also that he should see how the gods moved their hands in writing the starry script, how all physical forms had evolved. The ancient Egyptians had schools entirely on the model of those of the Indians, but they also learned how the spiritual forces were correlated with the physical world. Thus they taught new subjects. In ancient India, the pupil was shown the spiritual forces through clairvoyance, but in Egypt he was also shown what corresponded physically with the spiritual deeds. He was shown how every member of the physical body corresponded to some spiritual labor, how the heart, for example, corresponded to some spiritual work. The founder of this school, in which was shown not only the spiritual but also its work upon the physical, was the great initiate Hermes Trismegistus. He was, it was he, the thrice great Thoth, who first showed to men the entire physical world as the handwriting of the gods. Here we see how piece by piece our post-Atlantean cultures embodied their impulses in human evolution. 
Hermes appeared to the Egyptians like a divine ambassador. He gave then what had to be deciphered as the deed of the gods in the physical world. <clears throat> in all of this we have somewhat characterized the first three cultural epochs of the post-Atlantean time. Men had learned to value the physical plane. The fourth epoch, the Greco-Latin, is the period when man came even more into contact with the physical plane. In this time, man progressed so far that he not only saw the script of the gods in the physical world, but he also inserted his own self, his spiritual individuality, into the objective world. Such artistic creations as we find in Greece were not known earlier, that man could portray himself in sculpture, creating therein something like his physical self. This was achieved in the fourth cultural period. In this time we see man's inward spiritual elements step out of him onto the physical plane and flow into matter. This marriage between the spiritual and the material may be seen most clearly in the Greek temple. For everyone who can look back and see this temple, it is a wonderful work. The Greeks had the greatest architectonic gifts. Every art has its climax at some point, and here architecture had its high point. Modeling and painting reached their climax elsewhere. Despite the gigantic pyramids, the most wonderful architecture appears in the Greek temple. For what is attained here? A weak echo may be experienced by one who has an artistic feeling for space, who feels how a horizontal line is related to one that moves in the vertical. A number of cosmic truths light up in the soul that can simply feel how the column carries what is above it. One must be able to feel how all these lines were already invisibly present in space. The Greek artist saw the column as though clairvoyantly, and simply filled what he saw with matter. He saw space as altogether composed of life, as something permeated by living forces. How can the man of today get some impression of the liveliness that this space-filling had? We see a faint reflection of it in the old painters. For example, we can find paintings where angels float in space, and we have the feeling that the angels support each other. To lay li today little remains of this feeling for space. I shall make no objection to Böcklin's colors, footnote, Arnold Böcklin, 1827-1901, Swiss painter, and a footnote, but all occult space feeling is missing in him. Such a being as we find above his pieta, you cannot tell if it is supposed to be an angel or some other being, must waken in the observer the feeling that at any minute it may fall in the group below it. This must be emphasized when one tries to explain something of which hardly an inkling can be conveyed today, such as the space feeling of the Greeks. It must be expressly stated that this was of an occult nature. In a Greek temple it was as if space had given birth to itself out of its own lines. The result of this was that the divine beings for whom the temple was built and with whom the Greek as a clairvoyant was acquainted really descended into the temple, really felt comfortable in it. It is true that Pallas Athena, Zeus, etc. were actually within the temples. They had their bodies, their material bodies in these temples. For since these beings could incarnate only as far as an etheric body, they found their dwelling place in the physical world in these temples. Such a temple could become their physical body, in which their etheric body felt at home. One who understands the Greek temple knows that it differs profoundly from a Gothic cathedral. This is not a criticism of the Gothic, for the Gothic cathedral is a sublime work of art. But an outstanding, excuse me, but an understanding person can well imagine of a Greek temple that even if it stood in a solitude, with no people anywhere near, even if it were quite alone, it would be a whole. A Greek temple is complete even when nobody is praying in it. It is not soulless, it is not empty, for the God is in it. It is inhabited by the God. But a Gothic cathedral is only half complete if there are no worshippers within. One who understands this cannot think of a Gothic cathedral standing alone without a congregation of the faithful whose thoughts stream into it. All the Gothic forms and ornaments belong to what streams from it. No God, no spiritual being is close to the Gothic cathedral when the prayers of the faithful are not present. 
Only when the praying congregation is assembled is the cathedral filled with the divine. This is shown in the very word Dom, D-O-M. Dom, footnote, Dom in the German is the German for cathedral. End of footnote. But this is connected with the Dom in Christendom and similar words, which signify something collective. Even the word Duma, footnote, the Duma was a short-lived parliament in late Tsarist Russia, and the footnote, is related to this. The Greek temple is not a house for the faithful. It is shaped as a house that the God himself inhabits. It can stand alone. But in the Gothic cathedral, one feels at home only when it is filled by the believing throng, when the pious congregation is assembled, when the light of the sun shines through the colored window panes and the colors are diffused by the fine dust particles. Then, as often happened, the preacher in the cathedral pulpit would say, Even as the light is split into many colors, so is the single spiritual light, the divine force, divided among the crowds of souls and split into the diverse forces of the physical plane. Such Such words were often heard from the preacher. When perception and spiritual experience flowed together in this way, the cathedral was something complete. As in the great temple buildings, So was it in everything artistic among the Greeks. The marble of their sculptures took on the appearance of life. The Greek expressed in the physical what lived in his spiritual. Among the Greeks the marriage of the spiritual with the physical was a fact. The Roman went a step further in the conquest of the physical plane. The Greek had the capacity of embodying the soul spiritual in his works of art, but he still felt himself as part of a whole, of the polis, the city-state. He did not yet feel himself as a personality. This was also the case in the earlier cultures. The Egyptian did not feel himself as a separate person, but as an Egyptian, as a member of his people. Thus in Greece we find that a man laid little worth on feeling himself to be a person, but it was his greatest pride to be a Spartan or an Athenian. To be a personality, to be something in the world through the self, was felt for the first time in Rome. That a personality could be something for itself was first true for the Roman. The Romans worked out the concept of the citizen, and it was among them that jurisprudence, the science of law, arose. This is correctly regarded as a Roman invention. Only modern jurists, who know nothing of these facts, have had the lack of judgment to assert that law in this sense existed earlier. It is nonsense to speak of oriental lawgivers such as Hammurabi. There were no legal rules earlier. There were only divine commands. Footnote, our best modern scholars agree with views here expressed. See Wigmore, titled Panorama of the World's Legal Systems, Washington Law Com- Book Company, 1936, and a footnote. One would have to use harsh words if one were to speak objectively about this kind of science. The concept of the citizen first became a real feeling in ancient Rome. By that time man had brought the spiritual into the physical world as far as his own individuality. The last will and testament was invented in ancient Rome. The will of the single personality had become so strong that even beyond death it could determine what could be done with its property, its own things. The single personal man was now the determining factor. With this deed, man in his own individuality had brought the spiritual down to the physical plane. This was the lowest point of evolution. Man stood at his highest in the Indian culture. At this highest point, the Indian still moved in spiritual heights. In the second culture, the ancient Persian, man had already descended a little. In the third culture, the Egyptian, still more. In the fourth culture, man descended entirely to the physical plane, into matter. There came a point when man stood at the parting of the ways. Either he could sink lower and lower, or he could achieve the possibility of working up again, of fighting his way back into the spiritual world. But for this a spiritual impulse had to appear on the physical plane, a mighty thrust that could lean man back into the spiritual world. This mighty thrust was given through the appearance of Christ Jesus on earth. The divine spiritual Christ had to come to men in a physical human body, had to go through a physical appearance in the physical world. Now when man was wholly in the physical world, the God had to descend to him 
so he might find the way back into the spiritual world. Precisely this would not have been possible. Excuse me. Previously this would not have been possible. Today we have followed the evolution of the cultures of the post-Atlantean time down to their lowest point. We have seen how the spiritual impulse occurred through the Christ at the lowest point. Now man must rise again, transfigured by the Christ principle. We shall go on to show how the Egyptian culture emerges again in our time, but permeated by the Christ principle. The end of Lecture 9 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. Lecture 10 is entitled Old Myths as Pictures of Cosmic Facts, Darkening of Man's Spiritual Consciousness, The Initiation Principle of the Mysteries, given on September 12, 1908. There are many myths and sagas of the ancient Egyptians that were well known to the spiritual scientific world conception and are again becoming known but are not transmitted by the external historical traditions touching on the Egyptians. Some of these myths were preserved for us in the form in which they become domesticated, became domesticated in Greece. For most of the Greek legends that do not relate to Zeus and his family stem from the Egyptian mysteries. We shall occupy ourselves today with all sorts of mythical things that we can put to good use despite the assertion of modern cultural history that Greek mythology contains little of value. Why should we examine this other side of human evolution, the spiritual side? All that we see on the physical plane always remains an event and fact of the physical plane. But in the science of the spirit, we are interested not only in what lives on the physical plane, but also in all that occurs in the spiritual worlds. From what we have heard in our lectures, we know what happens to man between death and a new birth. We need only recall that in death, man enters the condition of consciousness that we call Kamaloka, in which, although he has become a spiritual being, he is held fast by the astral body. This is the time when man still demands something from the physical world, when he suffers from the fact that he is no longer in the physical world. Then comes the time when he must prepare himself for a new life, the consciousness condition of Devakan, where he is no longer immediately connected with the physical world and with physical impressions. In order to understand how life in Kamaloka differs from life in Devakan, let us consider two examples. We know that as soon as he has died, man does not lose his cravings and desires. Let us assume that during his life a man was a gourmet, taking great pleasure in choice food. When he dies, he does not at once lose this desire for enjoyment, this craving for dainties. These wishes do not live in the physical body, but in the astral. Therefore, since man retains his astral body after death, he also retains the craving, but he lacks the organ with which to satisfy this craving, the physical body. The craving for food depends on the astral body rather than on the physical, and after death the person feels a real lust for what pleased him most in life. For this reason he suffers after death until he has weaned himself of the desire for enjoyment, until he has sloughed off all the cravings that he had cultivated to the physical organs. Throughout this period he remains in Kamaloka. Then begins the time when he no longer makes demands of the type that can be satisfied only through physical organs. Then he enters into Devakan. In the same proportion that man ceases to be fettered to the physical world, he begins to develop a consciousness for the Devakanic world. This world becomes more and more illuminated, but he does not yet have an ego consciousness there, such as he had in this life, He is not yet independent there. In the Devakonic life he feels like a limb, like an organ of the entire spiritual world. As the hand, if it could feel, would feel itself to be a member of the physical organism, so man feels in his Devakonic consciousness that he is a limb of the spiritual world, a limb 
of the higher beings. He must grow toward his independence. But he already cooperates in the cosmos. He works on the plant kingdom from out the spiritual world. Man cooperates in all this, not for his own account, but as a ministering member of the spiritual world. When we thus describe what man experiences between death and a new birth, we must not imagine that the events of the devaconic world are not also subject to change. People are apt to believe privily that although our earth is changeable, everything up yonder, beyond death, remains the same. This is by no means the case. When we describe the sojourn in Devakan in this way, this means only that this is approximately the way things are there at the present time. But let us remember how it was when our souls were incarnated during the Egyptian culture. Then we looked upon the gigantic pyramids and the other mighty buildings. In earlier times things looked very different on this side, on the physical side. The countenance of the earth has changed greatly since then. We need only look into materialistic science, and we shall find, for example, how a few thousand years ago there were entirely different animals in Europe, how Europe looked quite different. The face of the earth is constantly changing, whence it comes that man is always entering into new conditions of existence. This is obvious to everyone. But when we describe the conditions of the spiritual world, people are prone to believe that what happened there when they died a thousand years before Christ is exactly the same as what happened when they are reborn and die again today. Just as the physical plane changes, so do things change in the other world. When man entered into Devakan from an Egyptian or a Greek life, his sojourn there was something quite different from what it is today. Evolution occurs there also. It is only natural that we should describe the present conditions in Devakan, but these have changed. This could have been surmised from what was brought up before us in the last lecture. We have seen how, when we go back to the Atlantean time, man lived more in the spiritual world, how he moved about in the spiritual world during sleep. We found that this decreases steadily after that time, but if we go back far enough, we find that man once lived entirely in the spiritual world. In ancient times the difference between sleep and death was not great. In primeval antiquity man had long periods of sleep, approximately as long as the time now consumed by an incarnation and the life after death. Through the fact that man descended to the physical plane, he became ever more entangled in this physical plane. We have shown how the Indian gazed into a high world, and how in Persia man already attempted to conquer the physical plane. Man descended ever further, and in the Greco-Latin time there occurred a marriage between spirit and matter, between the spiritual worlds and the physical plane. The more man approached the middle of this last epoch, the more he learned to love the physical world and take an interest in it. As this occurred, everything that we call experiences between death and a new birth also changed. If we go back to the first part of the first, excuse me, if we go back to the first part of the post-Atlantean period, we find that men took little interest in the physical world. The initiates of that time could withdraw into lofty worlds, into the devaconic worlds, and they communicated their experiences to the others. In the man who, with all his thoughts and all his senses, felt himself withdrawn into the true world, into his real home, the effect was that he took little interest in the conditions of the physical plane. But when he rose into Devakan, after having barely connected himself with the physical world, he possessed in Devakan a comparatively clear consciousness. When such a man incarnated again in the Persian culture, he felt himself more connected with physical matter, and he lost some of the clarity of his consciousness in Devakan. In the Egypto-Chaldean time, when man began to feel some affection for the external physical world, his consciousness in Devakan already became clouded and shadowy. This consciousness was still of a higher nature than that of his consciousness in the physical world, but it declined steadily in degree and became ever darker, 
up to the Greco-Latin time. During all this time the Devakonic consciousness became ever darker and more shadowy. It was not a dream consciousness, this was never the case. It was a consciousness of which man was fully aware. In the course of evolution it became darkened. The mysteries existed principally in order to enable man again to illuminate his consciousness rather than have only a shadowy consciousness in the spiritual world. Let us reflect that if there had been no mysteries, there would have been no initiates, in which case man would have had an increasingly vague and shadowy consciousness in the spiritual worlds. Only through the fact that parallel with the darkening of defagonic consciousness, initiation into the mysteries continued, together with the acquisition of certain faculties, with which selected persons could look into the spiritual worlds in full clarity. Only through the fact that the initiates could speak of this in myths and sagas was it possible for a ray of light to penetrate into the devakonic consciousness between death and a new birth. But all those who had made themselves comfortable in the physical world experienced this fading away of consciousness in the spiritual world. It was no fairy tale, but plain truth, that the initiates in the Eleusinian mysteries were able to have a special experience. The principle of initiation is that even during his life man can ascend to the spiritual worlds and learn what takes place there. The initiate of that time was actually able to learn directly from the shades in the spiritual world. The following is really the statement of an initiate, better a beggar on earth than a king in the realm of shades. These are the words of Achilles in Book 11 of the Odyssey, footnote and footnote. This statement is made out of the initiate's experience. We cannot take such things deeply enough, and we only understand them when we know the facts of the spiritual world. Now let us bring into more concrete form what we touched upon abstractly yesterday. Had nothing occurred other than man's descent into the physical world, consciousness between death and a new birth would have grown ever darker. Ultimately, men would have entirely lost their connection with the spiritual world. Now, however, singular it may appear to those who are only slightly infected with some form of materialism, what I am about to say is true. Had nothing else intervened in human evolution, mankind would have succumbed to spiritual death. But there is a possibility of illuminating the consciousness between death and a new birth. And this illumination can be achieved either through initiation or, to a lower degree, through man's participating in the spiritual world during this life, having experiences that do not die out with his bodies, but remain connected with the eternal core of his being, even in the spiritual world. This was the concern of the mysteries and of all spiritual development. It was the concern of the great initiates before Christ, and above all, of the being whom we call Christ. All other initiates were in a certain sense forerunners of the Christ. They were harbingers who pointed to the coming of the Christ. The advent of the Christ figure will now be described. Let us imagine a man who has never heard anything of the Christ, who has never been able to absorb the mysteries of the Gospel of John, who has never been able to say, I will imitate the life and work of the Christ. I will try to take his percepts into my own being. If we add that the Christ had never approached this man, he would not be able to take with him into the spiritual world the treasure that the man of today must take with him if he is to avoid the darkening of his consciousness. What man takes with him as a picture of Christ is a force that brightens the consciousness after death, that saves man from the fate that all men would have had if Christ had not appeared. If Christ had not appeared, the human essence would not have been maintained, but the consciousness after death could not have been illuminated. This is what gives real meaning to the advent of the Christ, that something was embodied into the core of man's being that has a wide significance. The event of Golgotha preserves man from spiritual death if he makes it one with his own being. 
We should not think that the other great leaders of mankind did not have a similar significance. There is no question of claiming some exclusive dogma for Christianity that would be an offense against true Christianity, for anyone acquainted with the facts knows that Christianity was also taught in the ancient mysteries. Such words as those of Augustine are profoundly true. What is called the Christian religion today existed already among the ancients and was present with the beginnings of the human race. But when Christ appeared in the flesh, the true religion, which was already in existence, received the name of Christian. What is important is not the name, but that we rightly understand the significance of the Christ impulse. Christ was the figure that appeared at the lowest point in evolution, but Buddha, Hermes, and the other great beings were in complete possession of the prophetic consciousness that the Christ would come that he lived in them. We can see this clearly when we study the figure of Buddha, and we must be quite clear as to what he was. What was Buddha in reality? Here we must touch on something that can be said only among students of the science of the Spirit. It is customary for people, even for theosophists, to conceive the mysteries of reincarnation in much too simple a way. One should not imagine that a soul that is embodied today in its three sheaths was embodied in the same way, in a foregoing incarnation, and again in one before that, always according to the same scheme. The secrets are much more complicated. Although H. P. Blavatsky took great pains to show her intimate pupils how complicated these secrets were, the matter is still not rightly understood today. People think simply that a soul goes into a body ever and again, but it is not so simple. Often we cannot fit an historical figure into such a scheme if we wish to understand it correctly. We must go about the matter in a much more complicated way. Already in Atlantis we meet beings who were among men as our fellows are today, but whom man saw and learned to know when he was in the spiritual world, severed from the body. We have already pointed out how man learned to know Thor, Zeus, Wotan, Baldur as, in, as actual companions. By day he lived in the physical world, but in the other condition of consciousness he learned to know spiritual beings who were going through a stage of evolution different from his. In this primeval period of the earth man did not yet have so solid a body as today. There was as yet nothing like a bony skeleton. The Atlantean body could be seen with physical eyes only to a certain extent, but there were beings who descended only so far as to incarnate in an etheric body. Then there were beings who still embodied themselves at that time when the air was permeated by water vapors. When man still lived in the water-fog atmosphere, these incarnations were possible for them. Such a figure was the later Wotan, for example. He said to himself, If man incarnates into, in this fluid matter, then I can also. Such a being assumed a human form and moved about in the physical world. But as the earth condensed and man took on ever denser forms, Wotan said, No, I shall not go into this dense matter. Then he remained in invisible worlds, in worlds removed from the earth. This was the general case with the divine spiritual beings, but from then on they could do something else. They could enter into a sort of connection with men who approached them, who evolved upward from below. We may imagine it thus. Man's evolutionary course was such that he was approaching his lowest point of development. Up to this point the gods had proceeded in company with men. Now they took another path, which was invisible for men on the physical plane. But men who lived according to the directions of the initiates, thereby purifying their finer bodies, approached them in a certain way. A man who was incarnated in the flesh, if he purified himself, could do this in such a way that he could be overshadowed by such a being who could not descend as far as the physical body. The physical body would have been too coarse for such a being. The result for such a being was that the astral and etheric bodies were permeated by a higher being, which had no other human form for itself, but could enter into another being and proclaim itself through this other being. 
When we are familiar with this phenomenon, we shall not regard incarnation as such a simple matter. There can perfectly well be a person who is the reincarnation of an earlier man, who has developed himself so far and purified his three bodies to such an extent that he is now a vessel for a higher being. Buddha became such a vessel for Wotan. The same being who was called Wotan in the Germanic myths appeared again as Buddha. Buddha and Wotan are even related linguistically. So we can say that much of what was in the mysteries of the Atlantean time continued in what the Buddha was able to announce. This is in harmony with the fact that what the Buddha experienced is something that the gods had experienced in those spiritual spheres, and that men also had experienced when they were still in those spheres. As the teaching of Wotan thus appeared again, it was a doctrine that paid little attention to the physical plane, emphasizing that the physical plane is a place of woe and that redemption from it is important. Much of the Wotan being spoke in the Buddha. Hence it is that stragglers from Atlantis have shown the deepest understanding for the Buddha teaching. Among the Asiatic population there are races that have remained at the Atlantean level, although externally they must of course move ahead with the earth evolution. Among the Mongolian peoples much of Atlantis has remained. They are stragglers from the old population of Atlantis. The stationary character in the Mongolian population is a heritage from Atlantis. Therefore the teachings of the Buddha are especially serviceable to such peoples and Buddhism has made great strides among them. The world moves onward following its course. One who can look deeply into the evolution of the world does not make choices, does not say that he has more inclination for this or that. He says that what religion a people has is a spiritual necessity. The European population, because it has ensnared itself in the physical world, finds it impossible to feel its way into Buddhism, to identify itself with the innermost teachings of the Buddha. Buddhism could never become a religion for all of humanity. For him who can see, there is no sympathy or antipathy here, but only a judgment in accordance with the facts. It would be an error to wish to spread Christianity from a center in Asia where other peoples are still settled, and Buddhism would be equally false for the European population. No religious view is right if it is not suited to the innermost needs at the time, and such a view will never be able to give a cultural impulse. These are things that we must grasp if we want to understand all the real connections. But one should not believe that the historical appearance of the Buddha immediately reveals all that lies within it. If I were to expound all this, I would need several hours, as yet we are far from having unraveled the complications of the historical Buddha. Something still lived in the Buddha. This is not only a being who came over out of the Atlantean time and incarnated in him, who incidentally was also a human Buddha. In addition to this, something else was contained in him, something of which he could say, I cannot yet comprehend this. It is something that ensouls me, but I only participate in it. This is the Christ being. This had already ensouled the great prophets. It was a well-known being in the more ancient mysteries, and everywhere and always men had pointed to him who was to come. And he came. But again he came in such a way that he accommodated himself to the historical necessities that lie behind evolution. Without special preparation, he could not incarnate himself in a physical body. It was still possible for him to incarnate in a sort of subconsciousness in the Buddha, but he could incarnate to live on the earth only if a physical body and etheric body and an astral body were specially prepared for him. The Christ had the greatest powers, but he could incarnate only if, through another being, a physical, an etheric, and an astral body, had been completely cleansed and purified. Thus the incarnation of the Christ could occur only if another being appeared who had developed himself to this point. This was Jesus of Nazareth. He had proceeded so far in his evolution that he was able during his life to purify his physical, etheric, and astral bodies in such a way that it was possible for him in the thirtieth year of his life 
to abandon these bodies, yet to leave them capable of life, usable for a higher being. Often when I have stated that a high stage of development was necessary for Jesus to be able to sacrifice his bodies, people have made a strange objection. But that is not a sacrifice. Nothing could be more beautiful. One cannot speak of a sacrifice when it is a question of turning over his bodies to such a high being. Yes, it is beautiful, and the sacrifice is not great when one looks at it abstractly, but only try to do the deed. Everyone would like to make the sacrifice, but only let them try it. One must have extraordinary forces if one is to purify the bodies in such a way as to leave them while they are capable of life, and to attain these forces many sacrifices are necessary. To be able to do this Jesus of Nazareth had to be an extreme, extraordinarily high individuality. The Gospel of John indicates where Jesus abandoned his physical, etheric, and astral bodies and entered into the spiritual world, and where the Christ being entered into the threefold corporeality. This happened at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. At this moment something significant occurred in the corporeality of Jesus of Nazareth. For the materialistic mind, what I now say is bound to be an abomination. Something special occurred in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. If we wish to understand what occurred at the moment of the baptism, when the Christ entered into Jesus, we must turn our attention to something that will appear singular but is nevertheless true. In the course of human evolution, the various organs have developed bit by bit, gradually working out their form. We have seen how when the organs had reached the level of the hips, certain structures and functions appeared in man. Then, too, as the human individuality became more self-reliant, a hardening of the bony system set in. The more independent man became, the more his bony system hardened, and the greater became the power of death. We must bear this in mind if we are to understand the following in the right way. Whence comes it that man must die and the body must completely disintegrate? It comes from the fact that in the human body something can be burned, even down to the bones. Fire has power over the human bone substance. Man has no power, at least no conscious power, over his bones. This power still lies outside man's abilities. In the moment when at the baptism in Jordan the Christ drew into the body of Jesus of Nazareth, in that moment the bony system of this being became something entirely different from what it is in other men. This was something that had never happened before and has not happened again to this day. With the Christ being there entered into the Jesus being something that had power over the forces that burn up the bones. Today the building up of the bones has not yet been placed within man's discretion, but this power reached right down into the bones. The conscious power of the Christ being extended into the bones. This is part of the meaning of the baptism by John. Therewith something was implanted in the earth that can be called the supremacy over death, for death first appeared in the world with the bones. Through the fact that power over the bones entered the human body, the victory over death also came into the world. Have a deep Here a deep mystery is expressed. Something in the highest degree holy entered into the bony system of Jesus of Nazareth through the Christ. Therefore it was not to be touched. For this reason the scripture had to be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Footnote the references to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 36, and footnote. That would have allowed human power to meddle in divine forces. Here we are gazing into a deep mystery of human evolution. Here we come to a significant concept of esoteric Christianity, which can show us how this Christianity is permeated with the highest truths. We come to the remainder of what confronts us in the baptism, through the fact that the Christ being took possession of the three bodies in which the ego being of Jesus formerly abode, a being was bound up with the earth that had earlier had its dwelling place in the sun. It had formerly been bound up with the earth until the moment when the sun departed from the earth. At that time the Christ also departed, and from then on he could exercise his power upon the earth only from outside. 
in the moment of the baptism, the high Christ Spirit again united himself in the full sense with the earth. Formerly he worked from outside, overshadowing the prophets and working in the mysteries. Now he was actually incarnated in a physical human body on the earth. If a being had been able to look down for thousands of years from a remote point in the universe, such a being as could see not only the physical earth but also its spiritual streams, its astral and etheric bodies, it would have seen significant events in the moment of the baptism by John and in the moment when the blood flowed from Christ's wounds on Golgotha. The earth's astral body was profoundly changed thereby. At this moment it took up something different. It took on different colors. A new force was implanted in the earth. What earlier had worked from without again became united with the earth, and thereby the attractive power between sun and earth will grow so strong that sun and earth will again unite, and man will unite with the sun spirits. It was the Christ who gave the possibility that the earth can again unite with the sun and be in the bosom of the Godhead. This is the event that occurred and its meaning. We had to expound this in order to understand what entered into the earth with the Christ. Through this we can grasp how through union with the Christ man can absorb something by which his consciousness will again be illuminated after death. If we keep this in mind, we shall also be able to grasp how there is evolution for the period between death and a new birth. Now let us ask for whose sake all this took place. At first man lived in the bosom of the Godhead. Then he descended to the physical plane. Had he remained above, he would never have achieved his present consciousness of self. He would never have received an ego. Only in the physical body could he kindle the consciousness of self in its bright clarity. He had to encounter external objects and become able to distinguish himself from the objects. He had to descend into the physical world. Only for the sake of man's ego did it happen that man descended. In respect to his ego, man stems from the gods. This ego descended out of the spiritual world. It was forged on the physical body so that it might become bright and clear. It is precisely the hardened matter of the human body that has given man his self-conscious ego that has made it possible for him to attain knowledge. But it also chained him to the earth mass, to the rock mass. Before he achieved his ego, man had physical body, etheric body, and astral body. As the ego gradually evolved in these three bodies, it transformed them. We must be quite clear that all man's higher members work on the physical body. The physical body is as it is, because the etheric astral and ego work on it. In a certain way, all the organs of the physical body are as they are, because the higher members have also been altered. Through the domination of the astral body, the backward beings became the different animal forms, the birds, for example. Through the fact that the ego became ever more conscious of itself, it also altered the astral body. We have already said that men separated themselves into groups. What we call the apocalyptic beasts are types in which this or that higher member has the upper hand. The ego gained predominance in the man form. All the organs are adapted to man's higher members. When the ego entered into the astral body and wholly permeated it, certain organs took form in man and in the animals that branched off later. Thus, for example, a particular organ may stem from the fact that an ego made its entry upon the earth. On the moon, no ego is connected with the beings in human evolution. Certain organs are connected with this development, the gall and the liver. The gall is the physical expression of the astral body. It is not bound up with the ego, but the ego works on the astral body, and from this the forces work on the gall. Now let us draw together the entire picture that the initiate made so clear to the Egyptian. The self-conscious man has been shackled to the earth body. Imagine the man fettered to the earth rock, fettered to the physical body, and in the course of evolution 
something arises that gnaws at his immortality. Think of the functions that have called forth the liver. They have arisen to the fact that the body was chained to the rocks of earth. The astral body gnaws at it. This is the picture that was given to the pupil in Egypt and made its way into Greece as the saga of Prometheus. We must not lay rough hands upon such a myth. We must not rob the butterfly of the dust on its wings. We must leave the dust on its wings. We must leave the dew on the blossoms instead of twisting and torturing such pictures. We should not say that Prometheus means this or that. We should try to present the real occult facts and then try to understand the pictures that have arisen out of the occult facts and have passed over into the consciousness of man. The Egyptian initiate led his pupil up to the point where he could grasp man's ego development. Such a picture was intended to shape his spirit. But the pupil was not to seize the facts with heavy hands. The picture was to stand bright and livingly before him, and the initiate did not wish to press dry, banal concepts into the truths he could give. He wanted to present truth in pictures. Poetry has done much for the Prometheus saga, beautifying it and ornamenting it. We should add nothing to the occult facts, but leave this delicate embellishment to the artist. We must still point to something else. Man, when he arrived on earth, was not yet endowed with the ego. Before the ego was secreted into the astral body, other forces had possession of this body. Then the light-flowing astral body was permeated by the ego. Before the ego entered therein, the astral forces of divine spiritual beings had been sent into man from outside. The astral body was also present but illuminated by divine spiritual beings. The astral body was pure and bright and it flowed around what was present as the rudiments of the physical and etheric bodies. It flowed around and through these and was quite pure. But egoism entered the advent of the ego. Excuse me, but egoism entered with the advent of the ego, and the astral body was darkened and lost its golden flow. This was lost more and more until man had descended to the lowest point of the physical plane in the Greco-Latin time. Then men had to consider how they could win back the pure flow of the astral body, and there arose in the Eloicinian mysteries what was known as the search for the original purity of the astral body. One aim of the Eloicinian mysteries, and also of the Egyptians, was to recapture the astral body in its pristine golden flow. The quest for the golden fleece was one of the probations of the Egyptian initiations, and this has been preserved for us in the wonderful saga of the voyage of Jason and the Argonauts. We have seen the development, when the form of the lower organs still resembled the boats of which we have spoken, the astral body in the water earth still had a golden sheen. In the water earth, man's astral body was permeated with golden light. The search for the astral body is portrayed in the voyage of the Argonauts. In a refined and subtle way, we must bring the quest for the golden fleece into connection with the Egyptian myth. External historical facts are linked with spiritual facts. One should not believe that this is mere symbol. The voyage of the Argonauts actually took place, just as the Trojan War actually took place. Outer events are the physiognomy for inner events. All these are historical events. For the Greek neophyte, the historical fact took place anew inwardly. The journey after the Golden Fleece, the achieving of the pure astral body. This is what we wanted to bring before our souls today. On this basis we shall become acquainted with other things from the mysteries and then we shall find how the Egyptian mysteries are connected with the life of today. The end of lecture 10. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. Lecture 11 is entitled The Ancient Egyptian Doctrine of Evolution, The Cosmic View of the Organs and Their Coarsening in modern times, given on September 13, 1908. At various points in this cycle of lectures, we have tried to present the facts of post-Atlantean evolution, and we have indicated that in our time there is a kind of repetition or resurrection of the experiences 
that mankind went through during the Egypto-Chaldean culture. It has been stated that the Indian period will repeat itself in the seventh period, the Persian in the sixth, the Egyptian in our time, and that the fourth, the Greco-Latin, stands by itself, so to say. Now concerning the Egyptian time and our own, we shall try to indicate how a certain recrudescence of outer and inner experiences is to be seen when we bring our time into connection with the Egyptian. We have seen that in the spiritual worlds there exist mysterious forces to which there correspond certain other forces in the physical world which effectuate the appearance of these repetitions. Thus do these resurrections of outer and inner experiences originate. In the middle between these stands the Greco-Latin period during which the Christ appeared upon the earth and the mystery of Golgotha took place. It was also pointed out that not only the external, evolutionary relationships on the physical plane had changed, but that also the relationships in the spiritual world had become different. I have described how the soul was in the Egyptian time when it looked upon the gigantic pyramids, how different it was when it reincarnated in the Greco-Latin period, and how different it is in our time. We have seen that not only does this occur, but that also for the period between death and a new birth in Kamaloka and Devakan, there takes place a sort of progress or transformation, so that the soul does not experience the same thing when it enters into Kamaloka or Devakan from an Egyptian or Greek or a modern body. Externally the world of the physical plane alters, but progress also occurs in the spiritual world, so that the soul always experiences something different there. It is primarily from the standpoint of this beyond that today we shall consider the mighty event of the Christ's appearance on our earth. We shall approach it in a much deeper way. Excuse me. We shall approach in a much deeper way the question: What significance has the advent of the Christ on our earth? What significance has the Christ's appearance for the dead souls, for the life on the other side, the spiritual side of existence? For this purpose we must explore many different things that affected souls in the Egyptian period both within and beyond the physical plane. From our studies of the earlier great epochs of earth evolution we can derive that the Egypto-Chaldean period furnishes a mirroring in knowledge and experience of what happened in the Lemurian time, of what happened on the earth during and after the departure of the moon. What men experienced then, they experienced again as a memory in what the Egyptian initiates gave them. The Egyptian initiate himself experienced during his initiation events that man otherwise experiences only when he passes through the portal of death. Let me read that again. The Egyptian initiate himself experienced during his initiation event events that man otherwise experiences only when he passes through the portal of death. To be sure, the Egyptian initiate experienced this in a different way than does the ordinary person who dies. He experienced it differently and in a much fuller way. It will be well for us now, as a basis for these considerations, to describe the essence of Egyptian initiation in a few words. This initiation is essentially different from that of the time after Christ, for through his advent, initiation was fundamentally altered. We have seen that men had to descend further and further into the material world, gaining increasing interest in the physical world. In the same proportion, however, the experience in the spiritual world between death and a new birth became more pale and shadowy. The livelier man's consciousness became in the physical world, the more he enjoyed being there, the more he discovered the laws of the physical plane, the dimmer his consciousness in the spiritual world became. The consciousness in the spiritual world reached its low point in the Greco-Latin time. But even before man had fully descended into these depths of matter, it had become impossible for him, within the physical body, to experience completely what one must experience if, during the period between birth and death, one seeks to gain insight into the spiritual world. 
The initiation event may be briefly described, and it is the same for initiations before and after Christ, although the conclusion is different. Initiation is nothing other than man's gaining the capacity of developing organs of vision in his higher bodies. Today man sees darkness when it is night. He is in the dark. This is because man has no organs of perception in his astral body. As the eyes and ears have formed themselves into physical organs of perception, so supersensible organs must be developed out of the higher members and assimilated into them. This occurs through certain exercises of concentration and meditation being given to the pupil. These exercises are performed after the pupil has first surveyed the knowledge of the spiritual worlds that can be given by the initiates. It has always been the case that the pupils had to learn what we today would call elementary theosophy. Much more strongly than today it was required that the pupils become acquainted with the truth in a regular progression. When there was enough theoretical preparation, and when the pupils were sufficiently mature, the exercises were given to them. These exercises have a definite purpose. <clears throat> when in his daily life man lets the impressions of the senses work upon him, these impressions bring certain fruits for the ordinary life on the physical plane. These impressions pass over into the astral body, which in turn transmits them to the ego. But these impressions are such that man cannot hold them fast when, with his astral body and ego, he slips out of his physical and etheric bodies during the night. What man receives in this way from the physical plane does not penetrate into him so strongly that he can retain it as a permanent impression. But when a person performs the exercises of meditation and concentration, these are so adjusted, in accordance with thousands of years of experience, that the astral body no longer loses the impressions but retains them when it slips out of the physical body in the night. Through the exercises the astral body receives plastic impressions which shape and member it as the physical organs have been membered. Thus the astral body is worked on for certain periods through these exercises. Thereby the supersensible organs of vision are imprinted on the astral body. It would be a long time, however, before man could use his organs of vision if they were imprinted only into his astral body. Something further must take place so that the astral body, when it returns into the etheric body, may stamp upon that body like the impression of a seal, what has taken shape within itself. Only when what has taken shape in the astral body imprints itself upon the etheric body, only then does the illumination take place that makes it possible for the person to see the spiritual world as he sees the physical world today. Here we can begin to grasp what kind of an impulse we have received through the appearance of Christ on earth. In the old initiations, the astral body had the strength to work upon the etheric body only when the etheric body had been lifted out of the physical body. This was because at that time the etheric body, had it remained connected with the physical body, would have exerted so much resistance that it could not have received the imprint of what the astral body had formed within itself. In the ancient initiations, therefore, for a period of three and a half days, the candidate was put into a death-like condition in which the physical body was deserted by the etheric body, while this latter, freed from the physical, united itself with the astral body. The astral then stamped into the etheric all that had been built into the astral through the exercises. When the Hierophant again awakened the candidate, the latter was illuminated. He knew what took place in the spiritual world, for he had made a remarkable journey during the three and a half days. He had been led through the fields of the spiritual world. He had seen what went on there, and he knew from direct experience what another person could learn only through revelation. A person thus initiated could, out of his own experiences, give knowledge of the beings who were in the spiritual world beyond the physical plane. When man had not yet descended so far into the physical plane, he could learn what was experienced in the spiritual world. There the candidate became acquainted with the true form of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. The initiate saw the contents of the myths 
during this journey into the spiritual world. He could then transmit this to other persons when he addressed it as myth or saga. <clears throat> he saw all this. He saw in what a special way the Osiris influences had shaped themselves when the moon had withdrawn from the earth. He saw how Horus issued from Isis and Osiris. He saw the four human types, the bull, the lion, the eagle, and the true man. He also saw what happened to man between death and a new birth. The Sphinx appeared to him as a real form. He experienced it. He could say, oh, I have seen the Sphinx, man as he was when he still had an animal-like form and his etheric body, similar to the human, only projected out of this animal-like form. The Sphinx was a real experience for the initiate. He even heard the question of the, Sphinx with its, of the Sphinx with its enigmatic content. He saw how the human body prepared itself out of the animality at a time when the head was only an etheric form, the ether head of the Sphinx. This was truth for the initiate, as were also the older forms of the gods, who had, so to speak, taken a different course of evolution. It has recently been said that certain beings pursued a different path in evolution. The individuality of Wotan, for example, takes such a different course. Up to a certain stage it travels together with man, but then it does not descend so deeply. Man descends further into matter, and only later will he again join these beings, who are completing their evolution in the earth time. We have seen that a being came, that a time came, excuse me, we have seen that a time came when Wotan no longer walked on our earth. Such beings, however, were not like Osiris and Isis. These latter were beings who had branched off still earlier, who completed their evolution on a higher level in full invisibility. These forms went through their special experiences. Let us look back into the Lemurian period. At that time, the etheric was not yet man-like in its form. In his etheric body, man was still similar to the animals, and the gods who descended then had to accommodate themselves to the same animal forms in which man lived on the earth. If a being wished to enter into a certain plane, it must fulfill the conditions of that plane. This is also the case here. The divine beings who were connected with the earth during the departure of the sun and moon, who were on the earth, had to take on a form that was possible at that time, an animal-like form. And since the Egyptian religious views pre present in a certain way a recapitulation of the Lemurian time, the Egyptian initiate looked upon the gods, Osiris and Isis, for example, as having animal-like forms. He still saw the higher gods with animal heads. Therefore, from an occult view, it was quite correct when such forms were represented with the head of a hawk or a ram in accordance with what the initiates knew. The gods were portrayed in the forms they had when they walked the earth. The outer images could only resemble what the initiates saw, but they were faithfully reproduced. The various divine beings changed a good deal. The forms in Lemuria were different from those in Atlantis. In those times, beings went through much more rapid changes than they do now. In addition, these forms were still filled with spirit. When one looks back on them, one sees them in their three bodies, but illuminated and rayed through by the astral and etheric light. This was accurately portrayed in the pictures. Modern men may laugh over the forms that were represented, but they do not know how realistic they were. Would note fantastic speculation on the reason why the Egyptians worshipped animal-headed gods began in classical times. See Plutarch, title on Isis and Osiris, section 72. End of footnote. There was one being who performed special services in that period of human evolution, when through the cosmic Tellurian powers the combining intellect was being organized in man. At that time the physical brain was prepared in such a way that man was able to develop intelligence later. This capacity was implanted in man and reckoned as one of the deeds of the god Manu. What was worked into man as intelligence was connected with this. If today we examine a person in whom a well-formed ability for judging and combining is present, if we examine him clairvoyantly, we find a strong expression and reflection of this fact 
in a green glittering and shining of the astral body, of the astral aura. The capacity for combining shows itself in green colors in the aura, especially in those who have been math- who have keen mathematical understanding. The ancient Egyptian initiates saw the god who implanted the faculty of intelligence in men, and in portraying him they painted him green, because they saw the green shimmering of his luminous astral and etheric form. Footnote for pictures of the green Osiris, see the frontispieces in both volumes of Budge titled Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection, and in volumes 2, 10, and 12 of Maspero and Rappaport titled History of Egypt, London, Grolier, 1901. End of footnote. Today this is still the color that glitters in the aura when the person's intelligence is stirred. Much time could be devoted to these connections if people really wanted to study this wonderful realism of the forms of the Egyptian gods. These representations of the divine forms, through the fact that they were so realistic and not at all arbitrary, had magical power, and one who could see more deeply would perceive that many mysteries were present in the coloring of these ancient forms. Here one can see deep into the workings of human evolution. We have seen how what the initiates saw was retained in the Sphinx. Of course, this was not retained in a photographic way, yet it was realistic. But the forms were always changing. The form of the Sphinx gives an image of how man once looked. His present form has been shaped by man himself. We know that through evolution on the earth various animal forms have been split off. What is an animal form? It is a form that has remained static while man proceeded further in evolution. In these forms we see arrested stages of evolution to the extent that these forms have become physical. In the spiritual something else has taken place. What man is spiritually has nothing to do with his physical forebears. Only the physical is connected with that. Man does not descend from the animals. The animal forms have remained unchanged. In man, however, the shape has been transformed to a certain level. The animals are previous, physical human forms fallen into decadence. The situation is different in another realm of evolution. Not only have the physical forms of the animals remained unchanged, but also the rudiments of the etheric and astral forms as well. Just as the lion, at the time when it split off, looked quite different than now, so certain soul spiritual forms degenerate in the course of time when they remain at a particular stage. It is a law of the spiritual world that something that stands still on the same level of spirit or soul becomes more and more decadent. If, for example, the Sphinx stands still, it degenerates and receives a form that is like a caricature of what it originally was. The Sphinx has been preserved in this way on the astral plane up to our own time. To those who, as initiates or in some other lawful manner, penetrate into the higher worlds, these decadent forms have little interest, being only decayed vagabonds in the spiritual world. But when, in exceptional cases, persons equipped with inferior clairvoyant gifts are led into the astral world, such decadent forms approach them. The true Sphinx approached Oedipus, but it it has not died even yet. Up to today it has not died. It only approaches man in another form. When persons who have remained standing at a certain stage of evolution among the peasants, perhaps, rest in the fields at midday in the hot glow of the summer sun and fall asleep, they may have what could be called a latent sunstroke. Through such an impact on the physical body, the astral and etheric are loosened from a part of the physical. Then such persons are translated to the astral plane, and they see this last decadent offspring of the Sphinx. This apparition is called by different names. In certain regions it is called the Midday Woman. Many people in the country will recount that they have met the midday woman. She appears in many regions under many different names. She is a descendant of the ancient Sphinx, and as the ancient Sphinx put questions to the men who experienced her, so this midday woman also asks questions. You may hear it told how the midday woman asks endless questions of the men whom she meets. This torment by questions is a relic of the old Sphinx. The midday woman has grown out of the ancient Sphinx. 
This indicates how evolution proceeds beyond the physical world, how whole tribes of spiritual beings decline until at last they are mere shadows of what they were originally. Here we see another characteristic of the way in which things are connected in evolution. We have mentioned this so it may be seen how manifold evolution is. Now to understand everything correctly, we must give some thought to the fact that in the course of time man has organized the fourth member, the ego, into what he brought with him at the beginning of earth evolution as his physical, etheric and astral bodies. I have shown how this ego permeates the astral body, claims it for itself, so that it dominates it as higher spiritual beings formerly dominated it. It is a deed of the higher beings that this ego was implanted in the astral body. If evolution had proceeded further in accordance with the views of certain higher beings, it would have been a different evolution from what has actually taken place. However, certain beings remained unchanged. They had not become capable of collaborating in implanting the ego in the astral body. When man appeared on the earth, he consisted of the physical, etheric, and astral bodies, all of which he shaped further. Now he was endowed with egohood by certain sublime beings who had their dwellings mainly on the sun and moon. These beings collaborated, so to speak, on the ego. But there were certain other beings who during the Saturn, Sun and Moon evolutions had not raised themselves so far that they could take part in this organizing of the ego. They could do only what they had learned on the moon. They had to limit themselves to working on the astral body, hence there was implanted in man's astral body something that did not belong to his noblest qualities, did not come from the higher sublime beings, but from the retarded intruders who had remained behind. Had these beings done this on the moon, it would have been something lofty. But through the fact that they did this on earth as stragglers, they worked into the astral body something they placed that placed it lower than it would have been otherwise. It became endowed with instincts and passions and with egoism. We must heed this fact, that man was influenced from two sides, that he received impacts in his astral body through which the latter became debased. Such a thing does not influence the astral body alone. Man is so constituted that the astral body transmits such an influence to the etheric body and this again to the physical body. The astral body is active in all parts, hence these spirits work on the etheric and physical through the astral body. Had these spiritual beings not been able to exercise such an influence, something would not have appeared in man at that time. This is an enhanced selfhood in man, an increased ego feeling. What this caused in the etheric body was all that appeared as darkening of judgment, as the possibility of error. All that the astral body accomplished in the physical body is the basis of what appeared as illness. That is the spiritual cause of illnesses in man. Among animals, becoming ill is something different. We see how illness has been transplanted into man. Illness is connected with the causes we have indicated here. And since the physical and etheric bodies are connected with the facts of heredity, so the principle of illness proceeds through the hereditary line. Let us again emphasize, however, that we must distinguish between inner illnesses and external injuries. If a man is run over, that is something entirely different. Also, certain internal illnesses can be connected with external causes. For example, if one eats something that upsets the stomach, that is something external. Before the above-mentioned beings gained influence over man in the course of evolution, he was so organized that he reacted far more powerfully than today toward evil pressing upon him from without. But in proportion to the influence that they gained over him, he lost the instincts he had possessed for what was not right. Formerly man's whole organization was such that he had fine instincts as to what was not right for him. Substances that are taken into the stomach today and there cause illness were then reject rejected simply through instinct. Gazing backward in time, we come to periods when man stood in a delicate relationship to the forces of his environment, reacting sensitively to the forces in his surroundings. In this respect, man grew ever less sure, less capable of rejecting what was not serviceable to him. This is connected with something else. As man grew more inward, 
something occurred in the world outside. What we know as the three other kingdoms of nature arose. The three kingdoms around us arose gradually. At first only man was present. Then the animal kingdom was added, then the plant kingdom, and finally the mineral kingdom. If we were to look back on the primeval earth, when the sun was still united with it, we would find a human being in and out of whom all the substances of the physical world moved. Man still lived in the womb of the gods. Everything still agreed with him, so to say. Then he had to leave behind what was precipitated as the animal kingdom. Had he carried this with him, he would not have been able to develop further. He had to expel the animal kingdom and later the plant kingdom. What exists outside in the animals and plants is nothing other than temperaments, passions, certain traits of men that they had to expel. And when man formed his bones, he expelled the mineral world. After a certain length of time, man could look upon his environment and say, Formerly I could endure you. Formerly you went in and out of me as air now does. When I still lived in the water earth, I could endure you. I digested you. Now you are outside, and I can no longer endure you, no longer digest you. <clears throat> as man became enclosed in his skin, as he became a self-contained separate being, he saw in the same proportion these kingdoms around him. If these beings had not worked on man, something else would not have happened. As long as man is healthy, he will stand in a normal relationship to the outer world. When he has disturbed forces within him, these must be driven back by the powers that man has. If his powers are too weak for this, if he cannot provide the normal resistance, then something must be infused into him from outside. Something must be implanted into him to fur furnish the resistance that he still had at the time the forces from the outside breathed in and out of him. It may be necessary when a person is ill that the forces of a metal, for example, should be injected into him. It is because man was in connection with metals earlier, in connection with plant juices and similar things, that we are justified in applying them as medicaments. When the Egyptian initiates could look back over the whole course of world evolution, they knew precisely how the individual organs of the human body corresponded with the substances of the external world. They knew which plants and which metals had to be administered to the patient. A great treasure of occult wisdom in the domain of medicine will be raised to light one day, wisdom that mankind formerly possessed. Not only are many things bungled in medicine today, but often special healing powers are ascribed to this or that in a one-sided way. The true occultist will never be one-sided. How often must we reject efforts that would make a compromise with the science of the spirit? The latter cannot support a one-sided method. On the contrary, it seeks to establish diversified research. It is one-sided to say, away with all poisons. People who say this do not know the true healing forces. Naturally, many stupid things are done today, for the professionals in most cases cannot grasp all the relationships, and a certain tyranny in medical science excludes what can proceed from occultism. If there were no campaigns against the oldest methods of medicine, against the injection of metals, there could be a reform. With modern experimentation, nothing is discovered that can hold its own against the traditional remedies, which only a lay ignorance can oppose as strongly as is often done. The ancient Egyptian initiates excelled in these secrets. They had an insight into the real relationships of evolution, and if today certain physicians speak in a condescending way of Egyptian medicine, you can soon tell from their tone that they know nothing about it. Here we touch upon something in the Egyptian initi initiation that should be known. <clears throat> it was such things as these that went over into the folk consciousness. Now we must reflect that the same souls that are in our bodies today were also incarnated in that ancient time. Let us remember that these souls saw all the images that the initiates made of what they knew through vision in the spiritual world. We know that what a soul takes into itself from incarnation to incarnation ever and again bears fruits in one or another way. Even though man cannot remember it, it is still true that what lives in the soul today lives in it because it was deposited there earlier. The soul is formed both within and beyond the physical life. When it was between birth and death, 
when it was between death and a new birth. Egyptian ideas were influential and modern ideas have proceeded from these. Today certain definite ideas are developing out of the Egyptian ideas. What is called Darwinism today did not arise because of external reasons. We are the same souls who in Egypt received the pictures of the animal forms of man's forebears. The old views have awakened again, but man has descended more deeply into the material world. He remembers that it was said to him, Our ancestors were animal forms, but he does not remember that these forms were gods. This is the psychological basis for the emergence of Darwinism. The figures of the gods appear in materialistic form. Thus there is an intimate spiritual connection between the old and the new, between the third and the fifth cultural periods. Now it is not the whole destiny of our time that man should see in material form what previously he saw in the spiritual. That would have been our fate had not the Christ impulse entered into human evolution in the meantime. This was not significant only for life on the physical plane. Today we shall see what significance the events of Palestine had for the other side of life, where the souls of the Egyptians sojourned after death. Here on the physical plane occurred the things we have already discussed. But the three years of Christ's activity, like the event of Golgotha and the baptism in Jordan, were of significance equally to the souls incarnated on earth and to those who were in the condition between death and a new birth. Let us recall the fact that the external physical expression for the ego is the blood. What works physically in the forces of the blood is the physical expression of the ego. In the course of evolution, too strong a measure of egoism made its appearance, which means that the egohood impressed the blood too powerfully. This surplus of egoism had to be expelled again if spirituality was to be restored to mankind. On Golgotha the impulse was given for this expulsion of egoism. <clears throat> in the same moment when the Redeemer's blood flowed on Golgotha, still other events were taking place in the spiritual world. The Redeemer's blood flowed out in the material world, while the superfluity of egoism passed over into the spiritual world. The super superfluous egoism had to vanish from the world and the impulse for this was given on Golgotha. In place of egoism, universal human love entered into mankind. But what was this event of Golgotha? What was this event of a three and a half day death on the physical plane? It was the enactment on the physical plane of what also had been experienced in spiritual development by one who was initiated. He was dead for three and a half days. One who had gone through this symbolical death could say to mankind, There is a conquering of death. There is something eternal in the world. Death was conquered by the initiates, and they felt themselves to be victors over death. The event of Golgotha signifies that what had often taken place in the mysteries of ancient times became for once an historical event, the conquering of death through the Spirit. This was taken out into the world on the physical plane. If we let this work upon our souls, we sense what happened with the mystery of Golgotha as something new, but also as an image of the ancient initiation. We feel this unique event entering into the world historically. What was the consequence of this? What could the initiate do? Out of his own experiences he could say to his fellow men, I know there is a spiritual world, that man can live in the spiritual world. I have lived in it for three and a half days and bring you tidings thence. I bring you the gifts of the spiritual world. These, were, these gifts were useful and healing to mankind. On the other hand, one who had lived as an initiate in the physical world could bring nothing similar to the dead. To the dead he could only say, all that happens on the physical plane is so ordered that man ought to be redeemed. Thus it was when in the spiritual world the ancient initiates held converse with the dead, to whom they could give only the teaching that life is suffering, only redemption will bring healing. Thus did Buddha still teach, thus did the initiate teach both the living and the dead. But through the event of Golgotha, death was conquered in the physical world and this signified something for those who had died and were in the spiritual world. Those who take up Christ in their innermost parts illuminate again their shadowy life in Devakan. 
The more man experiences here of the Christ, the brighter it becomes over there in the spiritual world. After the blood had flowed from the wounds of the Redeemer, this is something that belongs to the mysteries of Christianity, the Christ Spirit descended to the dead. This is one of the deepest mysteries of mankind. Christ descended to the dead and said to them, Over there something has happened of which it cannot be said that what happens there is not so important as what happens here. What man brings with him into the spiritual realm as a consequence of this event is a gift that can be brought out of the physical world into the spiritual world. These are the tidings that Christ brought to the dead in the three and a half days. He descended to the dead in order to redeem them. In the ancient initiation one could say that the fruits of the spiritual were reaped in the physical. Now an event occurred in the physical world that produced its fruits and did its work in the spiritual world. One can say that it was not in vain that man completed his descent to the physical plane. He completed it so that here in the physical world fruits could be produced for the spiritual world. That these fruits could be produced came to pass through Christ who was present among the living and among the dead, who gave an impulse so intense and so powerful that it shook the whole world. The end of Lecture 11 This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. This is Lecture 12, the last lecture in the cycle, entitled The Christ Impulse as Conqueror of Matter, given on September 14, 1908. In order to complete the task that we have envisioned, we must now study the character of our own time in the same sense in which we have studied the four post-Atlantean epochs up to the appearance of Christianity. We have seen how after the Atlantean catastrophe there evolved the ancient Indian epoch, the ancient Persian epoch, and the Egypto-Chaldean epoch. In the description of the fourth epoch, the Greco-Latin, we have seen that in a certain connection man at that time worked his way into the physical plane, and that this working into the physical world then reached its low point. Why is this time, which from one side we call the low point of human evolution, nevertheless so attractive, so sympathetic for the modern observer? Because this low point became the point of departure for many significant events of the present cultural epoch. We have seen how in this Greco-Latin culture a marriage was achieved between spirit and matter in Greek art. We have seen how the Greek temple was a building where the God could dwell, and that man could say, I have brought matter so far that for me it can be an expression of the spirit, so that in every detail I can feel something of this spirit. Thus it is with all Greek works of art. Thus it is with everything we have to say about the life of the Greeks. This world of artistic creations into which the spirit was implanted made matter so terribly attractive <clears throat> that among us in Middle Europe the great Goethe in his Faust tragedy sought to portray his own union with this epoch of culture. <clears throat> if in the succeeding time the progress of culture had continued in the same direction, what would have been the result? We can make this clear through a simple sketch. In the Greco-Latin time, man had descended to his lowest point, but in such a way that in no piece of matter was the spirit lost to him. In all the creations of this time, the spirit was incorporated in matter. When we look at the figure of a Greek god, we see everywhere how the Greek creative genius imprinted the spiritual on the external matter. The Greek had conquered matter, but the spirit had not been lost. The normal course of culture would have been that man should descend below this level, plunging down below matter so that the spirit would become the slave of matter. We need only turn an unprejudiced glance on our environment and we shall see that on the one side this has actually happened. The expression of this descent is materialism. True, in no period has man mastered matter more than in our time, but only for the satisfaction of bodily needs. We need only consider with what primitive means the gigantic pyramids were built, and then compare this with the boldness and loftiness with which the Egyptian spirit moved among the mysteries of world existence. We need only think of the deep sense in which, for the Egyptians, their pictures of the gods were images 
of what took place in the cosmos and on earth in the remote past. One who, at that time in Egypt, could look into the spiritual world, lived in something that became invisible in the Atlantean time, but was a fact of evolution in the Lemurian time. One who was not an initiate, who belonged to the common people, could still participate in these spiritual worlds with his whole feeling and his whole soul. Yet how primitive were the means with which these men had to work externally on the physical plane? Compare this with our own time. We need only read the innumerable eulogies that our contemporaries write about the enormous strides made in modern times. The science of the spirit makes no objection to this. Human achievements are increasing through the conquest of the elements. But let us look at the thing from another side. Let us look back to far distant times, when men ground their corn between simple stones, yet could look up into tremendous heights of the spiritual life. The majority of men today have no inkling of the heights that were surveyed at that time. They have no inkling of what a Chaldean initiate experienced when in his special manner he saw the stars, animals, plants and minerals in connection with man, when he recognized the healing forces. The Egyptian priests were men to whom the physicians of today could not hold a candle. The men of today cannot penetrate into these heights of the spiritual world. Only through the science of the spirit can an idea be formed of what the ancient Chaldean Egyptian initiates saw. For example, what we are offered today by way of interpretation of the inscriptions in which deep mysteries are contained is only a caricature of the ancient significance. Thus we find that in ancient times man had little power over the tools and equipment for labor on the physical plane, but he had enormous forces in relation to the spiritual world. Man is descending ever more deeply into matter, and more and more he devotes his spiritual powers to conquering the physical plane. Can we not say that the human spirit is becoming the slave of the physical plane? In a certain way man descends even below the physical plane. Man has devoted enormous spiritual force to inventing the steamship, the railway and the telephone. But what does he use these for? What a mass of spirit is thus diverted from life for the higher worlds. The spiritual scientist understands this and does not criticize in our time because he knows that it was necessary to conquer the physical plane. Yet it is true that the spirit has plunged down into the physical world. Is it important for the spirit that instead of grinding our own corn in a quern, We should be able to call Hamburg by long-distance telephone and order what we want to be sent from America by steamer. Great spiritual force has been applied to building up such connections with America and many other foreign lands, but we may ask whether the aim of all this is not the satisfaction of the material life, of our bodily needs. Since everything in the world is limited, there is not much spiritual force left over whereby man may ascend to the spiritual world after he has devoted so much to the material. The spirit has become the slave of matter. The Greek incorporated the spirit in his works of art, but today the spirit has descended very far. We have proof of this in the many technical and mechanical arrangements of our industry which serve only material needs. Now let us ask whether this process is completed and whether man has descended too far. This would have been the case were it not for the occurrence that we discussed in the preceding lectures. At the low point of human evolution something was infused into mankind through the Christ impulse that gave the stimulus to a new ascent. The entry of the Christ impulse into human evolution forms the other side of culture thereafter. It showed the way to the overcoming of matter. It brought the force through which death can be overcome. Thereby it offered to humanity the possibility of again raising itself above the level of the physical plane. This mightiest impulse had to be given, this impulse which became so efficacious that matter could be overcome in the magnificent way that is described in the Gospel of John, in the baptism in Jordan and the mystery of Golgotha. Christ Jesus, who was foretold by the prophets, gave the most powerful impulse of all human evolution.
man had to separate himself from the spiritual worlds in order to attach himself to them again with the Christ being. But we cannot yet understand this if we do not penetrate still more deeply into the connections of human evolution as a whole. We must point out that what we call the advent of the Christ on earth is an event that could occur only at the low point when man had sunk so far. The Greco-Latin period stands in the middle of the seven post-Atlantean epochs. No other period would have been the right one. When man became a personality, God also had to become a personality in order to save him, to give him the possibility of rising again. We have seen that in his Roman citizenship, the Roman first became conscious of his personality. Earlier man still lived in the heights of the spiritual world. Now he had descended entirely to the physical plane, and now he had to be led upward again through God himself. We must go more deeply into the third, the fifth, and the intermediate period. We shall not study Egyptian mythology in an academic way, but we must pick out the characteristic points in order to get deeper into the feeling life of the ancient Egyptians. Then we may ask how this illuminates our own time. There is one thing here that must be weighed carefully. We have seen how in the Egyptian myths and mysteries all the mighty pictures of the Sphinx, of Isis, of Osiris were memories of ancient human conditions. All this was like a reflection of ancient events on earth. Man looked back into his primeval past and saw his origin. The initiate could experience again the spiritual existence of his forebears. We have seen how man grew out of an original group soul condition. We could point out how these group souls were preserved in the forms of the four apocalyptic beasts. Man grew out of this condition in such a way that he gradually refined his body and achieved the development of individuality. We can follow this historically. Let us read the Germania of Tacitus. Footnote, the passage referred to is probably the following, pages 293 and 295 in the Loeb Classical Library Edition. Quote, sisters, children, mean as much to their uncle as to their father. Some tribes regard this blood tie as even closer and more sacred than that between son and father. The more relations a man has and the larger the number of his connections by marriage, the more influence has he in his age. It does not pay to have no ties. It is incumbent to take up a father's feuds or a kinsman's, not less than his friendship. End of quote, end of footnote. In, times, in the times described there, in the conditions of the Germanic regions in the first century after Christ, as there portrayed, we see how the consciousness of the individual is still bound up with the community, how the clan spirit rules, how the Cherusker, for example, still feels himself as a member of his clan. This consciousness <coughs> is still so strong that the individual seeks vengeance for another of the same group. It finds expression in the custom of the blood feud. Thus a sort of group soul condition prevailed. This condition was preserved into late post-Atlantean times, but only as an echo. In the last period of Atlantis, the group consciousness generally died out. It is only stragglers whom we have just described. In reality, the men of that time no longer knew anything of the group soul. In the Atlantean time, however, man, man did know of it. Then he did not yet say I of himself. This group soul feeling changed into something else in the following generations. Strange as it may seem, in ancient times memory had an entirely different meaning and power. What is memory today? Reflect on whether you can still recall the events of your earliest childhood. Probably you can remember very little, and beyond your childhood you cannot go at all. You will remember nothing of what lies before your birth. It was not like this in Atlantean times. Even in the first post-Atlantean time man could remember what his father, grandfather, and ancestors had experienced. There was no sense in saying that between birth and death there was an ego. The ego reached back for centuries in the memory. The ego reached as far as the blood flowed down from the remotest ancestors to the descendants. At that time the group ego was not to be thought of as extended in space over the contemporaries, but as proceeding upward in the generations. Therefore the modern man will never understand what appears as an echo of this in the tales of the patriarchs, that Adam, Noah, and others grew to be so old. 
They counted their ancestors through several generations upward to their ego. The modern man no longer can form any conception of this. In those days there would have been no sense in giving a single man a name between birth and death. In the whole series of ancestors, the memory continued upward for centuries. As far as man could remember through the centuries, so far was he given his name. Adam was, so to say, the ego that flowed with the blood through the generations. Only when we are acquainted with these actual facts do we know how things really were. Man felt sheltered in this series of generations. This is what the Bible means when it says, I and Father Abraham are one. When the adherent of the Old Testament said this, only then did he rightly feel himself as man within the line of ancestry. Among the first post-Atlanteans, even among the Egyptians, this consciousness was still present. Men felt the community of the blood, and this caused something special for the spiritual life. When a man dies today, he has a life in Kamaloka, after which comes a relatively long life in Devakan. But this is already a result of the Christ impulse. This was not the case in pre-Christian times. Then a man felt himself connected with the times of his forefathers. Today a man must wean himself in Kamaloka from the wishes and desires to which he has accustomed himself in the physical world. The duration of this condition depends upon this. <clears throat> we cling to our life between birth and death. In ancient times man clung to much more than this. Man was connected with the physical plane in such a way that he felt himself as a member of the whole physical series of generations. Thus in Kamaloka one did not merely have to work out the clinging to an individual physical existence, but one really had to traverse all that was connected with the generations up to the remotest ancestor. One experienced this backwards. One result of this was the deep truth underlying the expression to feel oneself sheltered in Abraham's bosom. One felt that after death he went upward through the whole row of ancestors and the road that one had to travel was called the way to the fathers. Only when one had traversed this path could he ascend into the spiritual worlds and travel the way of the gods. At that time the soul traveled first the path of the fathers and then the path of the gods. Now the various cultures did not come to abrupt ends. The essence of the Indian culture remained, although it underwent a change. It was preserved <coughs> alongside the following cultures. In the continuation of the Indian culture, that was contemporaneous with the Egyptian, something similar arose. Today we easily confuse what was later with what was earlier. Therefore it was emphasized that I was giving indications only out of the remotest periods. Among other things, the Indians now took up the, new, the view of the path of the fathers and the path of the gods. As a man <clears throat> became more initiated, freed himself more from dependence on home and the fathers, became more homeless, the path of the gods became longer, and the path of the fathers became, excuse me, the path of the gods became longer and the path of the fathers became shorter. One who clung closely to the fathers had a long father path and a short god path. In the terminology of the Orient, the way of the fathers was called Pitriyana, and the way of the gods was called Devayana. When we speak of Devakan, we should understand that this is only a distorted form of the word Devayana, the path of the gods. An old Vedantist would simply laugh at us if we came to him with descriptions such as we give of Devakan. It is not so easy to find one's way into the oriental methods of thinking and contemplating. As to those who pretend to give out oriental truths, these truths often must be protected from just such people. Many a person today who accepts something as Indian teaching has no idea that he is receiving, receiving a confused doctrine. The modern science of the spirit does not claim to be an oriental Indian teaching. In certain circles people love what comes from far away, perhaps from America, but the truth is at home everywhere. Antiquarian research belongs to scholars, but the science of the spirit is life. Its truth can be checked everywhere at any time. We must keep this before our minds. What we have just mentioned was practiced as well as theory among the ancient Egyptians. What was taught in the great mysteries was also practical. 
Something special was connected with this, as we shall learn as we penetrate further. The mysteries of the ancient Egyptians strove for something special. Today we may smile when we are told how the Pharaoh was, at a certain time, a kind of initiate, and how the Egyptians stood in relation to the Pharaoh and to his state and his institutions. For the modern European scholar, it is particularly comical when the Pharaoh gives himself the name Son of Horus, or even Horus. It seems singular to us that a man should be venerated as a god. Nothing more abstruse could be thought of. But the man of today does not understand the Pharaoh and his mission. He does not know what the Pharaoh initiation really was. Today we see in a people only a group of persons who can be counted. To the man of today a people is a meaningless abstraction. Footnote, the German word Volk has no convenient English equivalent. We shall translate it as people or folk in different contexts. End of footnote. The reality is simply a certain number of persons filling a certain area. But this is not a people for one who accepts the standpoint of occultism. Footnote, Rudolf Steiner's fullest discussion of this subject appears in his cycle of lectures, Mission of the Folk Souls, delivered in Oslo in 1910. End of footnote. As a single member, such as the finger belongs to the whole body, so do the single persons within the people belong to the folk soul. They are, as it were, embedded in it. But the folk soul is not physical. It is real only as an etheric form. It is an absolute reality. The initiate can commune with this soul. It is even much more real for him than are single individualities among the people, far more so than a single person. For the occultist, spiritual experiences are entirely valid, and there the folk soul is something thoroughly real. Let us examine briefly the connection between the folk soul and the individuals. If we think of the single individuals, the single egos, as little circles for external physical observation, they will be separate beings. But one who observes these single individualities spiritually sees them as though embedded in an etheric cloud, and this is the incorporation of the folk soul. If the single person thinks, feels, and wills something, he radiates his feelings and thoughts into the common folk soul. This is colored by his radiations, and the folk soul becomes permeated by the thoughts and feelings of the single persons. When we look away from the physical man and observe only his etheric and astral bodies and then observe the astral body of an entire people, we see that the astral body of the entire people receives its color shadings from the single persons. The Egyptian initiate knew this, but he also knew something further. When he observed this folk substance, the ancient Egyptian asked himself what really lived in the folk soul. What did he see therein? He saw in his folk soul the re-embodiment of Isis. He saw how she had once wandered among men. Isis worked in the folk soul. He saw in her the same influences as those that proceeded from the moon. These forces worked in the folk soul. What the Egyptian saw as Osiris worked in the individual spiritual radiations. Therein he recognized the Osiris influence. But Isis he saw in the folk soul. <clears throat> Thus Osiris was not visible on the physical plane. He had died for the physical plane. Only when a man had died was Osiris again placed before his eyes. Therefore we read in the title Book of the Dead how the Egyptian felt that he was united with Osiris in death, that he himself became an Osiris. Osiris and Isis worked together in the state and in the single person as his members. Now let us again consider the pharaoh, remembering that this was a reality for him. Each pharaoh received certain instructions before his initiation, to the end that he should not grasp this with his intellect only, but that it should become truth and reality for him. He had to be brought to the point where he could say to himself, If I am to rule this people, I must sacrifice a portion of my spirituality, I must extinguish a part of my astral and etheric bodies. The Osiris and Isis principles must work in me. I must will nothing personally. If I say something, Osiris must speak. If I do something, Osiris must do it. If I move my hand, Osiris and Isis must be active. I must represent Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris. Initiation is not erudition. 
But to be able to do something like this, to be able to make such a sacrifice, pertains to initiation. What the Pharaoh sacrificed of himself could be filled up with portions of the folk soul. The part of himself that the Pharaoh relinquished was just what gave him power. For justified power does not arise through a man's raising his own personality. It arises through his taking into himself something that transcends the boundaries of personality, a higher spiritual power. The Pharaoh took such a power into himself, and this was externally portrayed through the Uraeus serpent. <clears throat> Again we have peered into a mystery. We have seen something much higher than the explanations that are given today when the Pharaohs are discussed. If the Egyptians cherished f- such feelings, what would have to be his particular concern? It would be his particular concern that the folk soul should become as strong as possible, rich in good forces, and that it should not be diminished. The Egyptian initiates could not reckon with what man possessed through blood relationship. But what the forefathers had accumulated as spiritual riches was to become the property of the individual soul. This is indicated for us in the judging of the dead, where the man is brought before the forty-two assessors of the dead. There his deeds are weighed. Who are the forty-two judges of the dead? They are the ancestors. Footnote, a full description of these forty-two gods is to be found in Budge, title Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection, volume 1, pages 316 to 317. For a fairly good picture, see pages 344-45 of the same work. End of footnote. It was believed that each man's life was interwoven with the lives of forty-two ancestors. Therefore he had to answer to them as to whether he actually had taken up what they had offered to him spiritually. In this way, what was contained in the Egyptian mystery teachings was something that was to become practical for life, but which could also be turned to good account for the time beyond death, for the life between death and a new birth. In the Egyptian epoch, man was already entangled in the physical world. But at the same time he had to look up to his ancestors in the other world and cultivate in the physical world what he had inherited from them. Through this interest he was fettered to the physical plane, since he had to continue working on what his fathers had created. Now we must reflect that the souls of today are reincarnations of the ancient Egyptian souls. For the souls of today who experienced it in their Egyptian incarnation What is the significance of what happened at that time? All that the soul experienced at that time, between death and a new birth, has been woven into the soul, weaves within it, and has arisen again in our fifth period, which brings the fruits of the third period. These fruits appear in the inclinations and ideas of modern times, which have their causes in the ancient Egyptian world. Nowadays, all the ideas emerge which at that time were laid down in the soul as germs. Therefore it is easy to see that man's modern conquests on the physical plane are nothing more than a coarser version of the transfer of interest to the physical plane that was present in ancient Egypt, only people are now even more deeply ensnared in matter. In the mummifying of the dead we have already seen a cause of the materialistic views that we now experience on the physical plane. Let us imagine a soul of that time. Let us imagine a soul that then lived as a pupil of one of the ancient initiates. Such a pupil's spiritual gaze had been directed to the cosmos through actual perception. The way Osiris and Isis lived in the moon had become spiritual perception for him. Everything was permeated by divine spiritual beings. He had taken this into his soul. He is again incarnated in the fourth and fifth periods. In the fifth period such a person experiences all this again. It comes back to him as a memory. What happens to it now? The pupil had gazed up at all that lived in the world of the stars. This sight comes to life again in a certain person of the fifth period. He remembers what he saw and heard at that time. He cannot recognize it again because it has taken on a material coloring. It is no longer the spiritual that he sees but the material-mechanical relationships emerge again and he recreates the thoughts in materialistic form as memory. (coughs) Where he had previously seen divine beings, Isis and Osiris, now he sees only abstract forces without any spiritual bond. The spiritual relationships appear to him in thought form. 
Everything arises again, but in material form. Let us apply this to a particular soul, which at that time acquired insight into the great cosmic connections, and let us imagine that there arises again before this soul what it had seen spiritually in ancient Egypt. This appears again in this soul in the fifth post-Atlantean period, and we have the soul of Copernicus. Thus did the Copernican system arise as a memory tableau of spiritual experiences in ancient Egypt. The case is the same with Kepler's system. <clears throat> These men gave birth to their great laws out of their memories, out of what they had experienced in the Egyptian time. Now let us think how such a thing arises in the soul as a faint memory. And let us think also how what such a spirit truly thinks was in ancient Egypt experienced by him in spiritual form. What can such a spirit say to us? That it seems to him as though he looked back into ancient Egypt. It is as though he stated all this in a new form when such a spirit says, But now, a year and a half after the first dawning, a few months after the first full daylight, a few weeks after the pure sun had risen over these most wonderful contemplations, nothing holds me back any longer. I shall revel in holy fire. I shall scorn the sons of men with the simple confession that I am stealing the sacred vessels of the Egyptians to build with them an habitation for my God, far removed from the borders of Egypt. Is this not like an actual memory? which corresponds to the truth. This is Kepler's saying, and in his works we also find the following, The ancient memory is knocking at my heart. Wonderful are the connections of things in human evolution. Many such enigmatic sayings take on light and meaning when one senses the spiritual connections. Life becomes great and powerful, and we feel our way into a mighty whole when we understand that the single person is only an individual form of the spiritual that permeates the world. I have already pointed out that what has arisen in our time as Darwinism is a coarser, materialistic version of what the Egyptians portrayed as their gods in animal form. I was also able to show that if one understands Paracelsus correctly, his medical lore is a recrudescence of what was taught in the temples of ancient Egypt. Let us contemplate such a spirit as Paracelsus. We find a remarkable statement by him. One who has steeped himself in Paracelsus knows what a lofty spirit lived in him. He made a remarkable statement, saying that he had learned much in many ways, least of all in the academies, but much from old traditions and from the common people during his journeys through many lands. It is impossible here to give examples of the deep truths that are still present among the common people but are no longer understood, although Paracelsus could still turn them to account. He said that he had found one book containing deep medical truths. What book was it? The Bible. Thereby he meant not only the Old Testament, but also the New. One need only be able to read the Bible to find therein what Paracelsus found. What became of the medicine of Paracelsus? It is true that it is a memory of the ancient Egyptian methods of healing. But through the fact that he absorbed the mysteries of Christianity, the upward impulse his works are saturated with spiritual wisdom. They are filled with Christ. This is the path into the future. This is what everyone must do, who in modern times will pave the way back out of the fall into matter. We must not undervalue the great material progress, but there is also the possibility of letting the spiritual flow into it. One who studies what material science can offer today, who plunges into material science and is not too lazy to steep himself in it, such a man acts wisely also in relation to the science of the spirit. Much can be learned from the purely materialistic investigators. What is found there we can permeate with the pure spirit which the science of the spirit offers. If thus we permeate everything with the spiritual, then this is properly understood Christianity. It is a slander of the science of the spirit when men say that it is a fantastic view of the world. It can stand firmly on the ground of reality, and it would be only a most elementary beginning in the science of the spirit if one were to concentrate on a schematic representation of the higher worlds. It is not important that the student should simply know the things learned, learning the concepts by heart. This is not all that counts. The important thing 
is that the teachings about the higher worlds should become fruitful in men, that the true spiritual scientific teachings should be introduced into everything, into the everyday life. It is not so important that one should preach about universal brotherly love. It is best to speak of that as little as possible. Speaking in such phrases is like saying to the stove, Dear stove, it is your duty to warm this room, fulfill your duty. So it is with teaching, teachings that are given through such phrases. The important thing is the means. The stove remains cold if I simply tell it that it should be warm. It gets warm when it has fuel. People also remain cold when they are admonished. But what is fuel for the modern man? The specific facts of spiritual teaching are fuel for man. Footnote, this thought is more fully expounded in Rudolf Steiner's booklet Anthroposophical Ethics, comprising three lectures delivered in 1912 in <coughs> End of footnote. One should not be so lazy as to remain content with universal brotherhood. People must be given fuel. Then brotherhood will arise of itself. As the plants stretch out their blossoms to the sun, so must we all look up to the sun of the spiritual life. The important thing is that the matters we have examined here should not be accepted merely as theoretical doctrines, but that they should become a force in our souls. For every man in every position in practical life, they can give impulses for what he must create. People who look today at the science of the spirit with a certain scorn feel themselves superior to its fantastic teachings. They find unprovable assertions therein and say that one should cleave to the facts. <clears throat> if the spiritual scientist were made pusillanimous rather than bold through his life in the science of the spirit, it would be easy for him to lose his sureness and energy when he sees how just those persons who should understand the science of the spirit are the ones who utterly fail to grasp it. Our times easily look down on what the Egyptians recognized as their gods. The latter are said to be meaningless abstractions, but modern man is far more superstitious. He clings to entirely different gods who are authorities for him. Because he does not actually bend the knee before them, he does not notice what superstitions he cherishes. My dear friends, when we have thus been together again, we should always be mindful that when we disperse we should not take with us only a number of truths, but we should take away a collective impression, a feeling that can properly take the form of an impulse of will, an impulse to carry the science of the spirit into life and to allow nothing to disturb our confidence in it. Let us place a picture before our soul. One often hears it said, Oh, these seekers for the spirit, they assemble in their lodges and pursue all kinds of fantastic rubbish. A man of really modern views can have no part in that. The adherents of the science of the spirit sometimes seem to be a sort of pariah class, regarded as uneducated and untrained. Should we be discouraged because of this? No. We shall place a picture before our souls and arouse the feelings that are connected with it. We can recall something similar in past times, how something similar occurred in ancient Rome. We can see how in ancient Rome primitive Christianity spread among a despised class of people. We look with legitimate delight today on such things as the Colosseum constructed by Imperial Rome, but we can also look at the people who then regarded themselves as the choicest of their time. We can see how they sat in the circus and watched while the Christians were burned in the arena and incense was kindled to quench the stink of the burning bodies. Now let us look at those despised ones. They lived in the catacombs, in underground passages. There the spreading Christianity had to hide, there they erected the first Christian altars on the graves of their dead. There, below, they had their wonderful symbols and shrines. A strange feeling seizes us today when we walk through the catacombs, through that despised underground Rome. The Christians knew what awaited them, that first germ of the Christ impulse on earth, confined to the catacombs, was despised. But what remains of imperial Rome? It has disappeared from the earth, while what then lived in the catacombs has been exalted. Let us hope that those who today wish to make themselves the bearers of a spiritual worldview may preserve the confidence of the first Christians. The representatives of the science of the spirit may be despised by contemporary academic learning, but they know that they are working for what will bloom and thrive in the future. 
Let them learn to endure all the vexations of the present day. We are working into the future. This we may feel confidently and without arrogance, firm against the misunderstandings of our time. With such feelings, let us try to give permanence to what has passed before our souls. Let us take it away with us as force, and let us continue to work together fraternally in the right direction. The end of Lecture 12 and the end of the Lecture Cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled Egyptian Myths and Mysteries. Twelve Lectures by Rudolf Steiner given in Leipzig, September 2nd through the 14th, 1908.